This, evening, uh, this morning we have a subject uh, that bears upon the future of our world, our nations, and our families. And I'm going to drop back 2,500 years to sum up the problem in a few words, very choice words by the philosopher Confucius of China. He said in simple terms, as go the homes so goes the nation. There's no exceptions to that, no variations on it, no excuses for not doing it. If the home life of a country fails, the failure of the entire political system is inevitable. Now this was quite a while back. We've had a lot of experiences since then, but as far as I can tell, there are no experiences that justify the thought that this statement is not still active and important. In the 17th century, a Moravian educator by the name of Amos Kaminsky, Kaminius, better named in Latin, who established what is now regarded as the first idea of a public school system in Europe. He realized that education was necessary not only for the maintenance of governments, but for the encouragement and advancement of peoples. And he suggested a very important point. Where does education begin? He said, it's hard to tell just when, but it is definitely there the moment a child is born. A child who has no education until he goes to school is almost a failure. It's only by a tremendous effort of circumstances that he will outgrow primary ignorance. And primary knowledge is knowledge by example and environment. Primary knowledge is in the home, where the members work together for a common good. Primary knowledge is responsibility, in which each shares in the labors of the others. When this is not emphasized, and the individual is not privileged in this way, or the home is broken up by a variety of circumstances, the national survival is threatened. There cannot be a disregard for the basic laws of nature without detrimental results for all concerned. So Comedius said, we will start with the mother school. The child begins to learn how to live the moment its life begins, and researchers at the present time seem to indicate that the child is conscious of circumstances even before birth. It inherits not only the body of the parent, but it also inherits the psychic overtones, the pressures, the problems that have dominated the life of the parent. The broken home is already a threat to the survival of the child, his children, and their children for ten generations. We have completely forgotten the responsibilities that come with birth into this world. And we have forgotten what many of the ancients held to be true, Namely, that the world itself is the first school, the basic academy of all arts and sciences. And only by wisdom, thrift, integrity, and constant effort can we hope to graduate from the university of humanity. So at the uh, beginning of his treatise on children and education, Comenius mentions the mother school. The mother school is the school where the child learns seated at its mother's knee. She tells the stories. She sets the example. She shows patience under stress. She remains honorable in her relationship with all her children. She plays no favorites, but continues to indulge the natural maternal instinct of kindness and love. This goes into the child when it's a year old, or six months old, or one month old and begins to shape the character of that human being. Unless there is some kind of consideration for instruction and environment together, we're not going to get an answer to our problem. 
in just a little over t- a- a- t- about, see, 12 years, we are going to come into the next generation, the next century. We're going to carry into the future the products of today. And it probably would be very well to realize that we've been given 12 more years in which to straighten out some of the problems that we face today. This is without question the most difficult generation that has been recorded in history. And this difficulty is not innate, is not inevitable, and is not predestined. It is the result of a series of mistakes, a series of failures to adjust to facts. And one of the most important source of this information that we need is education. Education must be by both instruction and actual uh, doing of the thing. It must be by uh, education and by reliance upon the various facts of life. It must be learned from books, but also learned by doing. Being part of a constructive commonwealth ensures the de- development of the child. At the mother's knee, the child also learns the primitive principles of religion. Today we are beginning to realize, particularly in communized countries, that the lack of religious intention and instruction may be considered a basic cause for the collapse of a vast political structure. We cannot have any fulfillment of world conditions unless in the heart of himself each individual recognizes universal integrity, universal right, and knows that there's a plan in this world which man cannot break without punishment. You do not name to a theology, you do not have to attend a particular church. But if you do not believe in a principle of integrity at the base of life, you're in serious trouble. Now, Comenius started with this idea of the mother's school, the school in which the child simply learned. It learned its ABCs, it learned to talk from the members of the family. It learned the very basic principles of courtesy and thoughtfulness and kindness and patience. It also learned to cooperate with the members in their tasks and to realize from the beginning that life was not just fun. It was doing what needed to be done and enjoy doing it. The family was not always just fun but the family was worth more than any possible pain it could cause because it was the source of the final, ultimate security and integrity of all of its members. When the family began to fail, the world began to drift into a very desperate circumstance. Now the next thing that came to consideration for this comedians was how to set up a curriculum. How should children go to school? Well, if they have been properly brought up at home up up to the seventh or eighth year, they have very little likelihood of being ruined by schooling. They may not be completely educated by it, but if they can go to school without joining corruption on the campus, if they can go to school and learn the best they can and be sincerely interested in what they are learning, they will gain a certain amount presuming that the temperament, disposition, and integrity is already settled in them. From the family they have brought the knowledge of right and wrong. They have brought the knowledge of the things that can be done safely in a safe community and the things that cannot be done safely. So the child already has a moral code with which to test the education that he receives. And if he began to use this moral code, it would make a great difference in his educational convictions. Now, at the present time, of course, he is required to follow through a certain system of schooling. Very largely, this schooling is resented. Very largely, it is not providing the child with what it needs to know. It is not necessarily sufficient to teach a child reading, writing, and arithmetic. These things help, of course. But it is not necessary to do this without pointing out the proper use of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Today, the reading public is completely demoralized. Nobody knows what to read except when somebody else refers to it as important. So the paper pope in the United States and other European countries 
is prodigious. We are pounding into paper pulp thousands and millions of copies of books that just could not sell. Therefore, reading is a discriminating art. The individual reads what is important. He reads what is necessary to give him a better enlightenment and a better basis for personal action. Writing is also very important because he must put down his own thoughts. Writing is important in letter writing, in contracts which he has to read and sign. Writing comes all the way through life with one thing or another. But writing also is governed by the laws of integrity. Today we are suffering from writing that lacks integrity completely. We are being drenched with literature that de 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 destroys or debases us. We have uh, written, we are writing books that should never be published, and we are attending pictures which are based upon books that should never have been made. We have completely forgotten the integrities of these things, so that writing is now just a matter of learning how to scribble what you want to think or you do think, whether it is important or not. Arithmetic is very important to everyone. It was one of the sacred sciences of antiquity. But it was a science by means of which the human being could discover the source of himself, the great symbolism of the universe, astronomy, astrology, all of the great arts of um, medicine, all depend upon a degree of um, arithmetic. So arithmetic can be very valuable. It can become a science in itself. It opens the doors of many fields of learning. But all we use it for is to add up profit and loss. It never occurs to us that it is for any purpose except merchandising. Uh, again, adding up, looking whether taxes are correct or something of this nature. The whole history of mathematics, the fascination of it, as re revealed in the writings of Pythagoras, we have completely ignored. So we keep along using only the surface of knowledge, very carefully refraining from uh, becoming aware of the dents of values and realities that are beneath the surface. So Cornelius also tells us that it is very, very important in the mother school to learn the laws of integrity and in education to become aware of two basic realities. One is the importance of the descent of history as it is built up, uh, the history showing exactly what happens to people when they do exactly what they actually do. History is a story of disillusionments, but it is also the story of the inevitable consequences of mistakes. It shows another example of how we have gradually drifted away from every value that was permanent, every realization that could have advanced our destinies, and become hopelessly enmeshed in a complicated the technique of survival, a survival which some way must be cut as Alexander cut the Gordian knot. We cannot go on the way we are. Every form of learning is only important if it helps us to understand universal truths. Lord Bacon in his advancement of learning and in the Novum Organum it clearly points out that the new organ of learning is the ability of the individual to interpret from things that happen the meaning of those things, the causes of them, and their inevitable results. He could uh, estimate scientifically what would happen to a broken home, but science today is not too much interested in it. It is mostly considered a social problem. We cannot consider anything social or as long as it is dependent upon a universal law for the fulfillment of itself. That which is ordained by natural law cannot be denied by man regardless of his optimism on the subject. So Cominius also went on to point out the great importance of learning from what is obviously true. And he uh, tells us that we can study the history of all mankind by studying one family. That we can study the entire history of the world by studying the reign of one king or one ruler. We can find out what happens always if we are willing to look. We know what brought nations down 
we know what built them up. We know that most of them were founded by militarists and varied by philosophers. We know that all of these truths are available. We can tell now, very easily, the story of Caesar. We know what happened uh, to Napoleon. We are quite aware of when Genghis Khan uh, was tied to the back of his horse after death so his followers would not know that he is dead. We know all these things. We realize what wars have done, what has caused them, and how they have de destroyed the labors of ages. And still, with all this knowledge available, we make exactly the same mistakes and do nothing to change the situation. We have a feeling, which seemingly is quite widespread, that we can buy freedom from the consequences of conduct, that we can find some way of escaping the natural destiny of causes by some financial advantage. If we can buy someone's goodwill, we can go forward with it. If we lose this goodwill, we lose the job. So nothing remains of the integrity only of what we have to do in order to maintain what we regard as the proper level of civilization. Another interesting point I think to make is that a materialistic culture, as both Confucius and Comenius pointed out, is bound to fail. There is no possibility of maintaining it because no one can behave whose ideals are not higher than those of daily profit and loss. We cannot hope to create an educated world while education is pointed only at the accumulation of wealth. We go to university because we want a better kind of job. We think that with a proper alphabet after our names that we're entitled to a high place in the economic structure. Sometimes we are, more often we are not. But in any event, we believe in education as providing us for advancement in the professions. I know at least three persons who have been in school now for over 30 years. <laughs> they have not only taken the basic school, but they have also gone to the university. Then they have taken postgraduate courses. Then they have taken postgraduate courses on the postgraduate courses. And one of them ended up as a carpenter. Another one is still taking courses and will probably do so as long as he lives. He has learned all these things, but he has never had the time to do anything with any of it. Well, this is probably an exceptional case. But the uh, fact remains, and it is very evident, that we are not able uh, to make the situation vital because of our own attitudes on education. Education is frightfully important, but it must be based upon a basic idealism. It must be based upon the fact that there are rules and laws in life that human beings cannot break. And also that in all probabilities those that are above the human level do not break these laws either. There are laws that are immutable. And these laws should be understood. We do a research project to try to find out whether there's any life on Mars, but we don't do any research projects to find out what universal law requires of us. We do not gain from all this knowledge a proper code of life. We do not have a proper understanding generally acceptable that the laws of, of uh, mysticism or of spiritual living are just as exact as the laws of physics. Wherever a law is a law, the human being must keep it or break it. If he keeps it, he gains from it. If he breaks from it, he punishes himself. Now this kind of thinking is basic to people who have studied almost any field of learning. There is no possible way in which a learning process can condone a, a false standard of, conduct, of conduct. Always the uh, condoning ends in tragedy. So to go back to the Comenius concept, which is pretty good, I think, and was carried on down through the 17th and 18th centuries, we have to have a system of education 
that prevents the individual from breaking the laws of his relationship with life, with nature, and with whatever that divine plan may be that is immutable in the heavens and immutable upon the earth. These rules must be understood. Virtue, in the last analysis, is obedience to the law that governs life. The virtuous individual is not the smug one, but the law keeper, the individual who is dedicated to protecting value wherever it may be. There is no question in the world that in this particular period between now and the end of the present century, we have a great deal of house cleaning that must be done. We, have got, we must change a great many of our attitudes on life and on living and on profession and on arts and sciences and music and theater and drama. We find ourselves in a field of constant exploitation. Now, exploitation has so little value that it is hardly worth considering. But somehow, when we take away from the individual the concept of personal immortality or destroy his belief in a divine power, when we do these things to him, we turn him over to a negative situation which he cannot carry with dignity. We turn him over to a complete frustration. And out of this frustration comes the natural result of materialism. If he has been taught materialism long enough and carefully enough, he is going to become what you might call a child or a person given to fun. He's going to make a game out of life. It may be a financial game, a professional game, a game in sports or something, but life will become some kind of a game. The reason why he takes it this way is because he assumes that he has no future. If he assumes that when he lies down in the grave, this is the end of him forever, then there seems to be no reason to cultivate anything except to do what you want to. But this has two shortcomings. He is not alone in this world. There are six billion of us here now, and when each individual does just what he wants to do, chaos is upon us in all its forms. Actually, almost everything that we do is a violation of common sense, a violation of the integrities of living. We store up enormous fortunes in order to get a little adulation, and we cannot take one cent of it out of this life. We come into this life with nothing but ourselves, and we leave with nothing but ourselves. Why then should this life be so frantic if we don't believe in anything? If we don't believe in anything, we might just as well be sober about it and go along and say to ourselves, the best I can do if I'm going to disappear forever is to make as good a life as I can here, make as many people happy as I can, to make some contribution to future people who are going to lie down in darkness as I will. But instead of thinking this way, the individual is apt to go on narcotics to forget everything. All of these things are the evidence that the educational system is in desperate need of rearrangement and reorganization and regeneration. The educational system, looking for facts, should finally get down to the ba basic facts and do something about them. Now, it isn't all the fault of the educator. We're not meaning to condemn him for that. It's not his fault. It is a combination of several different streams of tradition which are in conflict with each other and to which prevent the victory of any integrity over the confusion of modern activity. We are in constant conflict between the levels of our thinking. When we think for a moment of art, the next moment we're thinking of our stock investments. We are mixed up in all kinds of attitudes and beliefs, many of which are a waste of time and many more a waste of money. And yet we follow all these things because we have been taught to. Education has been made a, an instrument of fitting in to a society. It began perhaps in New England when the educational facilities were limited to the elite. Uh, only certain persons were expected to be educated. 
And if they expect it to be educated, they expect it to sit in judgment over everybody else. They were just a little better than anybody else. Uh, they had no particular ability. Maybe they never did an honest day's work in their lives, but they were superior simply because they had this education to which they were entitled by heredity. This type of superiority is, of course, completely wrong and produced nothing but snobbishness. But it went on for a long time. And even today, there is a great sense of special importance in an individual who has attended a very important university or who has taken very important specialized courses on some subject. It is assumed that he knows more. That does not necessarily follow at all that he knows more. All thing is that he has been to school longer and perhaps has been exposed to ideas that he never could use and were not true in the first place. So we cannot depend on those things for our actions or our activities or our solutions. We have to go back and begin to work on our own nature and our own abilities. We have to work from the simple basis that the first thing we have to be in this world is to be honest human beings. Until we gain that, there will never be any peace, there will never be any equity, there will never be any understanding or friendship, there will never be any end to the conflict and turmoil on every level of life. We have got to be honorable people. We've got to be true to principles. And what principles? Not principles of taking it away from somebody else. The principles are based upon principles of integrity within ourselves. Each person, as he approaches this next century, should be prepared uh, to face the importance of self-improvement, that he will do something to do better than he has ever done it before, that he will carry forward into the next generation young people who have been taught to love work to rejoice in responsibility and to do the work of the world graciously, cheerfully, and without expectations of, se of special privileges. All we have to do is to get this thing straightened out educationally is to teach from what we know and not from textbooks. We must teach from the things that we can see. We can take all uh, the experiences of our neighbors and also, of course, historical experience. But we can find ways to know that certain things don't work. Napoleon, for example, made the statement one day that almost any clever general can win a battle. But only with the help of God in peace can he run a nation. Without the belief in God, you cannot hold a civilization together. Call it superstition. Call it anything you want to. But the absence of it absolutely condemns a structure to failure. There is no way of escaping it. Therefore, it's apparent that nature didn't want us to think that way. But probably the greatest proof to the skeptic of the existence of God is the fact that nothing can get along without him. So he, we might as well learn these things. And instead of learning some technical explanation of some way of training lizards and Galapagos, we get down to working with people working with the problem as it is and make education the art of sharing knowledge and not sharing prejudices and conceits. Education should also help us to get out of the mess that we're in rather than to get in deeper. Today we have accepted the fact that our natural resources are gradually dwindling. We respect the fact that our industrialism is destroying our climate that all kinds of things that we're doing, we're wearing out our natural resources, we're exhausting our petroleum supply, we're doing all kinds of unpleasant things with life, and we're still looking for a place to throw our garbage at somewhere away from here. We are actually wasteful, thoughtless about the facts while we go out to explore this inner structure of the galaxy. Well, that's very nice if someone has the time and leisure to do it. No one should say he shouldn't or couldn't. But there's a time for the best minds that we have in the world to get out of politics and into the facts of life. 
we are in a position where we have got to come back to basics. We have got to come back to the realization of what works. We have to realize that there is something more than a sham in the fact that the Confucius taught that every living person should live as though his ancestors were in the room with him, seeing how he did it, and his descendants in the same room to congratulate him or punish him for his mistakes. That we do not live alone at all. We live with the past and the future. And sometimes that past is only an hour away and that future ten minutes ahead. All these things mean the universe must be put together into a pattern that we can live with and live by. If we cannot do this, it's going to be very, very hard to get into the next century successfully. But supposing we make a very definite effort this way, how can we get to the point where we can face the year that is coming up? Well, face the year that begins with the year 2000. This is the problem that we have to face now, and there are ways in which we can do it. And one of the ways is to clear up as much complex as we can while we're here now. It is thus better to carry as little trouble into the future as possible. The present trend is to throw all the trouble into the future, assuming that in good time and in space and in eternity all this garbage will disappear. There's no proof that it will not also disappear and take us with it, because we cannot continue in the present course. We cannot go on wasting resources, destroying our ozone levels, and finding it impossible to get rid of our nuclear rubbish. We cannot do these things unless we do something about it. We cannot kill off all the wildlife without doing something to nature that we shouldn't. We cannot actually afford to live constantly for and forever in the face of the very things that are causing us the most trouble. We cannot build a new generation on the present TV programming, which is very poor in most cases, and actually can contribute to the delinquency of the young, but we don't look at it that way. But the thing that is important is that these great corporations show a profit. But the fact of the matter is, most of them show a debit, but we don't see it. The debit being the deterioration of society. We have to do a lot of things to clean up our world if you wish to hand it on to somebody else. I know an old lady who always liked to rent a flat that she had upstairs. It was her principal source of income. And of course, when people moved out, they generally left it either dirty or disordered. But see, before she rented it again, she thoroughly cleaned it and made it just as neat and immaculate as possible. Before we go into the 21st century, we've got to clean house. We've got to make sure that that is not going to be a century in which the rocks that we have tossed up in the air come down and hit us on the head. There is no way of escaping the facts of life. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And we have been told also that as the twig is bent, so the tree is inclined. I'll tell you, the 20th century has certainly inclined this tree. We have more problems, more difficulties, and more abuses of power than the rest of history put together. We talk about being civilized in the face of the past, and yet the bloodiest wars and most terrible persecution ever recorded are in our present century. We have not learned the essential lessons of civilization. And if we can't learn them, how can we ever gain that knowledge? We can't relive the history personally, but we can depend upon education to summarize these various facts, make them available to us honorably. Civilization should learn to know, as Napoleon found out, that you cannot civilize a faithless world. You cannot take the belief in good out of an individual without place, replacing it with a faith in evil. All these things are part of a very simple, honest approach to realities. The average Vermont farmer could work it out, but all our technicians can't get there. They just do not understand that we live in an honest universe. And the first and most important thing that education should do for all of us is to help us to find the honesty and integrity in the law of cause and effect. 
that as we sow, so shall ye reap. And in any case, no matter how we try to avoid it, those things which we do intentionally wrong come back to us as misery and suffering. Today, the average American home, and world home for that matter, is a mass of conflicts. The stability of the home is vanishing. Why? Primarily because of the profit system. Uh, because the costs of living have become so high, profit, and uh, members of the family feel that they have to go out and become employed, which was not their original purpose. All of these things come along, and they have to be solved. They cannot be brushed under the edge of the table. They've got to be met and understood and worked with, and our whole system of knowledge has got to get down to the point where it handles and works with the essentials of daily living. It's wonderful to think it might put around on Jupiter sometime. That's very interesting and very thrilling. But that we can keep the man here from going crazy or committing crime or committing suicide or dying of a broken heart, all these things are much more intimate. We've got to take care of our own people. We've got to help them to find their way We've got to get rid of the ambitious of rulership. We've got to get rid of all the dictators and things of that kind and go back to common sense. And common sense in this matter means honesty. It means the individual doing what is the greater good to the greater number. It is getting himself out of the way as a center of ambition in a universe in which ambition is a basic mistake. So we have everywhere we go and everywhere we turn the obvious evidence that our education needs redoing. We do have the understanding that young people coming out of our high schools may already be on narcotics. What has the school done to prevent this? What has the family done to prevent it? The family probably hasn't often talked about it because it doesn't want to. The school does not bring up much of this work. A little bit now is coming in to help us out. But the great problems of this kind are not the problems that are brought head-on to the life of young people. It's beginning, and it's because it is beginning, we have great hope for better things to come. It is now part of our life, but between now and the end of the century, we've really got to get at it. We've got to put the power behind right. We've got to support everything that we can possibly support that goes in the right direction. But most of all, Immediately, we must find out that we ourselves are going in the right direction. The things that we are doing must be the right things. Our attitudes towards each other must be right. Uh, Confucius again brought out that problem very well in one of his discussions, namely that the beginning of civilization is one family being civilized within itself. Then we have the brood family which was the final unit in almost all civilizations. The family group was the basis of all international relations, all the vast outspread of cities, towns, and countries, all began with the brood clan, a family of one elder or two or three elders and a small little civilization of 30 or 40 people. These people had to learn to live together in a great world of wonders, dangers, and fears. It had to depend upon itself. It had to work for itself. It had to feed itself. And it had to create within itself a form of government, the means of which it could survive. And this government was vested first in the elders, those who had the long living, who had been here a long time, and therefore uh, were well acquainted with the mysteries of life. The second source of this instruction was the dead, the ancestor who had gone before, and who was contacted by the sachem, or the medicine priest, and received the information necessary to guide the people. Then, the third, was the young person himself, learning at the feet of the old and the wise and the true. The Indians had no uh, salaried instructors. The, uh, the old ones were the true ones. Grandfather and great-grandfather, they knew the way. They knew the land. Uh, the young people lived, lived in close contact with them. Then there was something else that I think we should do something with, but we don't know just what yet to do with it. 
but in almost all ancient civilizations, a child is not born a citizen. Now this is a very interesting point. Citizenship must be earned. It is not conveyed by birth. In Egypt, citizenship was physically manifested by cutting the curl of child hair from the head of the new citizen. When he became a citizen, the child lock was cut from his head. Up to that time, he had to go around with it. And to be a citizen, he had to prove something. He wasn't a citizen because he was born there. He wasn't said a citizen because his family was rich. He wasn't a citizen for any of these reasons. He had to grow and prove his earned citizenship. He had certain labors he must perform, certain dangers he must face, certain decisions he must make. He had to give something of his life to the good of the rest of the group. He had to recognize that citizenship meant to assume his share of the responsibilities of all other members of the community. He was responsible for the happiness of those who were miserable or the treating of those who were hungry. It was part of his life as a citizen to work for the common good first, last, and all the time. And the first thing that each citizen was expected to be willing to sacrifice for the common good was his own life. Now, after he had passed through these uh, tests and so forth, which took quite a time, which had to prove physical bravery, mental thoughtfulness, emotional integrity, had to prove that he was capable of forgetting himself in the cause of something better, he was finally brought to a grand general meeting of the community. He was given the symbols of maturity and then became a citizen and was qualified to vote. But he had to prove that he had, was a dedicated individual to that community or he could not gain citizenship. And after he gained it, woe to him if he broke his vows. <laughs> Instead of being forgiven, he would probably be either executed or exiled for life. There was no fooling with citizenship. Citizenship was a, a gift of the, of the people in approval of the conduct of an individual. No other possible way. Now, we probably might not want to follow the example of Lycurgus with his Spartan way of life, but he was of the opinion that no individual was worth anything who had never suffered for his principles. And he affirmed and assumed that most people suffered not for their principles, but for the lack of them. And that therefore it would be a good plan a few, once in a while that a person should suffer for a real principle that was worthwhile. So Lycurgus played courage, integrity, and uh, personal virtue were the great principles of life. So we have all these different things to think about. And then in citizenship we have another problem that we find in connection with the ancient American civilizations. The citizenship required certain proofs of maturity. In the Aztec civilization, they were quite aware of the existence of alcoholic beverages. But uh, if a young person, man or woman, became an alcoholic, it was something that was not even considered uh, a minor offense. It was a major offense. And for this they could be severely punished. They also might be imprisoned just for being intoxicated once. But if they were over a certain age, they could drink all they wanted. Because it was said then they weren't responsible for anything they did anyway. It's a curious rule. But at the same time, I'll tell you, a lot of people here would be a bit out of business before they were 60. It was the way things we do things. But every nation is in some way of trying to cope with the individual who would escape the normal burdens of life. Curriculum that could go into the next century and do something with it. Well, I think the first thing that we should have to have with that is a complete revision of education. The word itself carries the secret of itself. The word education comes from a word which means, means to draw forth or to bring forth. We interpret it as something to cram in. 
which is a mistake to start with. Education is to release the conscious desire of the individual to think reasonably. Education is to use the mind purposefully and to establish purposes by which the mental energies are properly employed. Education is therefore the victory of growth over the victory of profit and loss. All these things mean that actually the education is to prepare the person for citizenship in a way of life which he likes to believe is important. If it is important, then he must protect it. If he doesn't protect it, he doesn't believe it. The idea of somebody else protecting it is, must not carry on or we go nowhere. The first problem then is to get an education started that is fundamental. First upon the fundamental of integrity. That actual honesty is the key to survival. No nation can live without it. No family can live without it. No person can live without it. This is essential. If we do not have that, we are going to have the chaos we have now. We are going to have 160 nations fighting each other, or at least at sword points. We are going to have misunderstandings, bankruptcies. We are going to have all kinds of exploitations, misrepresentations, and misuse of funds and authority. All this will happen unless we have integrity. And the only way we can have integrity is to believe in it. To believe in it to the degree that we will cooperate with others of similar integrity, but withdraw our cooperation from those who are lacking in it. We do not need to go out and persecute people, but if they do not uh, reveal a reasonable degree of honesty, we may not necessarily continue to patronize their products or participate in their way of life. The beginning then we have is an educational review that ends up with a golden rule or the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount or the wisdom of Confucius, the teachings of Buddha, the mathematical genius of Pythagoras, the mysticism of Christ. We have these things. We don't even teach them except on rare occasions. We cannot get a word of them into the practical or popular learning. We can get nothing but sarcasm and sinecure. But the basis of the fact is that if we do this and continue with it, we will make another century of dissension. Now, if we try to go into the next century with the educational facilities of today, what's going to happen? We're going to find that we're going to run out of everything. We have to conserve just in order to survive. We cannot have many more cars or we can't use them at all. And that wouldn't be much of an overstatement. We can't have many more cars because of the uh, petroleum problem. We are gradually exhausting the resources of the planet. And many of these resources are irreplaceable. We can't replace them. The only real resource of importance that we can replace is wood. We can replace this, but for almost everything else, when it's gone, it's gone. And it will take thousands of years of actual austerity to restore even a fragment of it. So everything we have is running out from misuse, waste, and abuse. And no one seems to believe that this means that virtue means to conserve. It doesn't really do anything to tell us that there are new ways of building a life. Supposing we decided that we can't afford the luxury living that we have today, is this going to decimate us beyond all hope? Not really, because most people are sick and tired of what we do have, but do not do anything better. Actually, the simple life is a life in which the individual can release his own internal resources. He can learn to think. He can learn to be a friend. He can learn to study things that will advance his character. He can develop interest in arts and in all kinds of meaning and in science. He can do all these things if he does them from a heart focus of integrity within himself. If he is willing to assume the realities of life, he can study anything he wants. But if his only interest in studying is to find something that he can make an extra dollar from, 
then the whole theory of education falls apart. We should simplify the material life in order that the mind, the soul, and the, the upper uh, metaphysical parts of ourselves have a chance to express. We will find a wealth of value there that we have never even suspected that we had. We will find that we have been wasting ages on dross when we could have known the true gold of wisdom. We should also learn that true knowledge is not boresome, is not academically ponderous, and does not mean that we must live a stuffy and more or less uh, cynical life. Knowledge in its truest sense is an open door to happiness. It is the way in which we can do everything that is right because it is right and be proud we've done it. Now we, can, we are ashamed to be right in many instances because it differs from the pro popular practical policies of the day. So it is very important for the individual to know that the whole thing rests with him. We can have new elections, we can elect different people, we may occasionally get a good one, but sometimes the law of averages will work out. But the mere fact of this does not mean much. The real fact lies in the probability that the time will come when the human being is self-governing. And when he is self-governing, then he doesn't need to worry about any of the other forms of government. He can have any, any form he wants as long as he handles it correctly. He can study any subject that he wants as long as he knows in his own heart that that substance is part, or that subject, is part of a greater reality. It's in many cases in uh, Oriental and Occidental learning, the uh, idea of the guru teaching system has had uh, strength. The Greeks had it very strongly, the Latins less, but uh, some. The Germanic and Nordic tribes were very much involved in it, and of course it was all over Asia that the guru system was the final system in which instruction was in the hands of persons dedicated to a religious life. This does not mean that this religious teacher, the guru, will do nothing but sing ha psalms or preach sermons. The guru was a person of mature learning. He was the ideal father or grandfather of a family. He may have not had any family of his own, but his world was his family. The guru taught anything that the individual needed to know, mathematics, or astronomy, or science, or legislation, or jurisprudence. All these things the guru could teach and did, but he taught them in, the, in an environment of integrities. He taught them as great spiritual realities part of a divine plan for the perfection of the creation. He had all the knowledge that we have, but he had something else, a deep abiding faith, faith in something that was immutable and immovable, which he had to obey, but which in the last analysis could be the subject of an unlimited affection. That which is the root of life is the most lovable thing that can exist, the reality itself. So the guru system taught these young people. It taught them to go out. They became householders. They raised families. And when they came to a certain age, they retired. And when they retired, they returned to the ashram. The teaching they received before they were 20 years old came back on them or to them in their 60s. And they returned to the holy life. And because of the fact that they had lived it between, learned it early, and had it in their older years, they died in peace with all living things. They were never bored by their age because they were always in the presence of the divine. This system may not be practical for us, but it did a great deal to help these people to keep principles and to be willing to suffer for causes that were worthwhile. Another very important thing is that the average person in teaching is unable to discipline a child. We do not know how to make the child obedient without thrashing it or doing something that hurts it and which in turn hurts us. The answer is very simple. We start with the child. We will start perhaps before the child is born and we will have a happy little home. The mother and father love each other. They're not perfect. But affection dominates that little household. Then along comes the child. 
And long before that child is born, the love of those two parents is already working in the embryo. It is working in the magnetic and etheric field of that child. He is being educated already by the first education of all, the mother school of Comenius. And finally the child is born, and it is born into a home where it is happy, where its parents are glad to have it, where the, uh, the conception is intentional, and that they are going to make this a major part of their lives. They're not going to shunt it off onto keepers and watchers and things of this nature. They're going to stay and take care of it because it is there to do and to serve. And out of proper parenthood, this little thing grows up to kindergarten age and then begins to contact the outer world. And there, to the average parent, is the most dangerous moment of life because it doesn't know what's going to do. Is it suddenly the child is escaping. It is going to come part of this world that is very far from perfect. But it's not as bad as that. The child has had seven years of basic indoctrination. Not the indoctrination of words or the reading of nice sermons, but the indoctrination of actually being part of something that is lovable, that is so honest, that is, that is true, that is clean, that is honorable. That child going into the school is not going to fall immediately for the corruptions of others have not brought up that well. A little later, it's not going to say yes to the in, infiltration of drugs. It's not going to become an alcoholic. It's not going to do any of these things because in the root of itself, it has experienced truth. It has experienced reality in the womb of the mother. And this it can never lose. And even if it has its troubles later, these troubles will have something inside of her or him that will resist that which is corruption. There will be something that will say, I can't do it. I don't feel right. It is contrary to what I learned in the first five years of life. And because those are the formative years when the child is taking hold of the body, is learning to become aware of this world, these are the most important years of its life. So if we can get the child uh, up to about seven or eight years old, uh, at that, during that period, from one to eight, we can then bring that child to the realization that this is a beautiful world, that this is a wonderful place to be, that this is an opportunity to have wonderful friendships and deep affections, and in due time become parents of another generation. If we can teach young people this type of thing, then we can send them to the public school and they will change the school. But if this same family divorces before the child is born, or shortly thereafter, or is nagging and fussing all the time, is competing in, it, in all activities, is ambitious for early advancement, and so forth, the little thing has no foundation. It believes that life is conflict because it is all it has ever known. And where this happens, things don't work so well. So the beginning of the re reformation of education is that the child shall receive it from its own parents, not in ABCs or two fours and sixes, but in the simple experience of life as a beautiful necessity in which it is important that we each keep our values, enrich our values, and stay clean regardless of the circumstances around us in life. If we can do this, we're going to have a good start for an educational policy. And I think it is coming. Each day now we hear more about these changes that must happen. We see more and more of the unfortunate consequences of neglecting integrities for the sake of profit. If there's any major improvement in the next century, it is that we will work for truth and for principles and not solely for profits. Because profit is something that is just beyond the capacity of our planet. We cannot be a planet of continual profit for all concerned. It is not possible either that we should allow the part that doesn't profit to simply rot or go into revolution after revolution in effort to restore some kind of balance. All these things are foolish, unnecessary, and are evidences of 
ex ex excessive egotism of the unwillingness to face the realities of life. So we think that uh, even now, we, get, we see in the paper, we read, we observe in television, occasional programs in which we know that people are trying. But most people are trying without knowing how to do it. They try to write, uh, write the, in the name of the best candidate and all that type of thing. But they really do not know how to get at the substance of the needed changes. If any of these people have small children, there's the first place where the job should be done. Because one good child starting out in life can save an empire. And we do not know who is going to do it, but it has to be someone whose dedications are stronger than their ambitions. This is uh, the way we have to face it. For out of this mysterious gate through which we all pass into life, is this endless flood of, se of souls coming into birth and rebirth, coming in to have their part in the forming of a new world. And the best thing we can do is, when they come in is to give them the first lessons, the first grade in, the, in a profitable and proper way of living. And those first lessons will be of greater value to them throughout the life and to the future of the world than all the academic degrees they can possibly earn. It is very important now that education becomes a part of public life. We as people must educate each other. The system of education cannot escape from the boundaries with which it has been limited. It is not all the fault of the educator. It is the fault of those who do not want education. All they want is a course in profit making. They do not want to become wise, they want to become rich. They do not want to become the sincere servants of a good cause. They want to be distinguished citizens, notable for their philanthropies, and many of their philanthropies include supporting the colleges. It is all a, a kind of twisted pattern that is wrong. We can't break all these rules, but we can make sure that we do not break them in the most fundamental of all rules to get you new lives started right on this planet. That instead of trying to take care of a lot of things we can't do much about anyway, that we should try to take care of these important and desperately necessary things that face us today. It seems, therefore, that if we work together, we're going to have a new kind of education, an education that is going to put idealism first which is going to prove that divine things are stronger and more real than material things. We are going to find the necessity of a kind of worship in which integrities become associated with our daily life. We may not know where honesty comes from or why we need it, but if we study history, we know we have to have it. And these things will gradually clear themselves up if we rewrite a lot of curricula and get a new point of view on some of these essential purposes of life, I think that we can be safely say that the mother's school has to come back, and maybe father will be the athletic teacher in the school, and some of the other children will be in the higher grades, and some will be in the lower grades, and some will be taken care of by the children in the higher grades. All that is wonderful. It is part of life. And if these people in those formative years are happy, and love each other, and work together for each other, and realize that happiness for one means happiness for all, and that there can be no happiness for one at the expense of the others. When these things become more or less apparent, we will, for the first time in the history of the world, be practical. We are told that we must be practical. And be to us, practical has meant to be wealthy, and stylish, and luxurious. Actually, to be practical means that which accomplishes the greatest good for the greatest number. And we achieve this by making the changes in our own lives. More better homes in our world will reduce wars and revolutions, destroy these various delinquencies, get rid of these fanatical dictators, and all these things which are part of a great materialistic tragedy which we have permitted 
simply because we have had the thoughtfulness or the depth of understanding to realize that we have to grow sometimes through experience, that we have to suffer a little as we go along, but that this suffering, if it produces in the end a better world for all of us, is well worth what it costs. We have to learn in the 21st century that education begins in the home and spreads from there throughout the world, and that the individual who starts out right has a beginning that is true, has ideas and motives that are true, will come out all right. I know several families in which the family has never been particularly rich, never will be rich, but they are very happy families. They are much more happy than these uh, families in which extravagance is the order of the day. They have what they have because, as a family, they are caring. They love each other. They work together. They have fun together. And each one has a deep belief in the integrities of the family, and this will always attempt to live it. These families are happy, which is much we can say for them, but you can seldom as ever find a family of great wealth, authority, and power that is happy. There is nothing but spoilage, there is nothing but conflict, there is nothing but aggression in these families which are dominated by the wealth syndrome. Actually, therefore, we should all be educating ourselves a little bit for what's coming on. If we're in that age group where it's not so too likely that we will pass into the 21st century, then we have to work uh, with those who are older. Perhaps we need to work with those of our own age group who are feeling the mis misery and mystery of age, that there is nothing there to worry about. All there is necessary is that the moment we start uh, to find ourselves learning. The uh, woman uh, said to the Greek philosopher, who was lying on his couch in the back of a little adobe house in Athens, and the friends were all gathered in the front room because he was dying, and they were all there to be with Grandpa to the end. And one of them happened to look into the back room where he was lying on his couch, and he, he was leaning, sitting up a little bit, and he had his hand to his ear. And he was listening attentively to the gossip in the front room. <laughs> and uh, he, the neighbor said, But Grandfather, why are you listening like this? You're going to die in a few hours. And the grandpa said, well, that's probably true, but I'm alive now, and while I'm alive, I can learn. <laughs> well, that's a good attitude. While we are alive, we can earn and learn. While we are alive, we can earn a better destiny. We can make a great move of some kind in the closing years of life that reverses the entire pattern of our misdeeds and mistakes. Or we can very quietly retire into the realization of what we have tried to do and the things we have dreamed about and the hopes we have of the future. But before we can have a safe world in which it is proper to live, human beings as a group must believe in the future. They must believe that if they are young, the part of their future is here. If they are old, most of their future is elsewhere. But in any case, there is future. Certain is death for the living, certain is birth for the dead, says the Bhagavad Gita. And we are all here in an eternal quest for realities, for truths, and for that kind of inner wisdom, which is that peace, which is passive understanding. We are here to grow, to learn, to love, and to serve. And if we fulfill these requirements, we will never fail very much. And a world that becomes aware of this and begins to try to do it, will gain very rapidly. And I think between now and the end of this century, we will find major changes in the Board of Education. We will find new approach to the idea of teaching. We shall try to understand why a student graduating cum laude from the university is on narcotics at the same time. These things are pretty presenting to us, as in the case of the marijuana and cocaine and heroin, alcohol. These are all presenting to us the fact that as individuals we have not been taught to be strong. We have not been taught to cling to what is right. We have not been taught to put the good of ourselves 
at the head of our list. We know these various bad habits were likely to kill us or destroy us so completely that we are helpless, but it never occurs to us still. This promise of a moment in which we feel ten feet tall is the most important thing. If we die tomorrow, that is not so important. But this feeling of being ten feet high has gotten into us. Actually, at this moment, the modern world feels ten feet high. Everything is tremendous. There are little problems, like world wars, but they'll pass. Everyone will be rich. Everyone will live his own life. No one will be responsible. The cities will take care of the children. Some other city will take care of the aged. And each individual is on his own for a fun generation. Now, this is what might be termed a high. This is the same thing as taking cocaine and feeling as though you rule the world. Our world has been fed on various false drugs and not in actual terms, but false policies, false doctrines, false beliefs, false allegiances, until we now feel that we are just about the most perfect creatures that ever lived. But if we take a second look, we have to revise the estimate somewhat. We have to realize that in this last generation, we have broken no more natural laws. We have misused more natural products. We have involved ourselves in more unnatural situations than ever before in history. We have broken rules that our ancestors didn't even know existed. We have done everything that we could just to do what we want to right now. And the circumstances don't mean anything because we're going to be dead anyway. This thinking has got to go. And if it doesn't go any other way, it will go in great wars and atomic bombing. But it doesn't need to. And we are assured that if many fall because of their iniquities, the just person shall not be moved. We will not fall, individually or collectively, if we keep the rules, serve the truth, and do our daily chores as best we can. We will also have peace of mind, peace of soul, and because of doing it right, we have to have better help. And the individual will no longer drop dead with a heart attack at 49. All these things come as the result of changes in our way of life. Live straight and we'll live straight. Live straight and things will work right. Do all the things that we can to the best of our ability and pass on to our descendants a heritage of good examples. If we will do these things, we will not have much else to worry about. We can then go peacefully along in the day, enjoying the arts and scraps, partaking in all those things which are useful, but avoiding carefully any form of activity which is unnecessarily harmful to any other creature. Live harmlessly, as Gandhi said. Live as far as we can to help the world rather than to hurt it. Not, uh, not out to to slaughter animals, but to take care of them. Not out to slaughter human beings, but to save them. And not out simply to enslave, technically, even though we do not use the term, millions of human beings. All these things will cause trouble. And we must, if we correct the mistakes in ourselves, we will end most of the world's suffering. And the school should teach this. The school should teach that every student is a potential force for good if he is willing to accept the responsibility. And if he is not willing to accept the responsibility, it is foolish indeed for the community to educate him. But he will, with proper example and proper encouragement and proper, proper inspiration, accept this standard of better living. He will be proud that he can make, be part of a generation that makes a contribution to the future. All these things are possible to him, and he can do them. But he needs a little help at this time. The schooling should begin to teach him what he should be, instead of preparing him to fit like a robot into some prearranged economic system. The whole theory of robot economics that we know now is a dying theory. It will not last. It cannot go on. It can never be profitable. But it will fascinate all kinds of people who love gadgets and who think of all change as progress. 
and every new complication is a thing of beauty and a joy forever. This type of thinking is not any good. But if we work with it properly and the schools will get back of getting to the truth of the matter, getting to the facts that we know are true and which we can prove from 5,000 years of written history and 50 years of current miseries. All these things we can learn, understand, and take to the consideration. If we can get together, we can become the members of a planet, and the Earth itself will be the great schoolhouse. Here we will all be here, as A.B. Sedanian students in the College of the Holy Spirit. That was what the Rosicrucians called it. We all are in school. It doesn't, it doesn't show from here much, but this is the Little Road Schoolhouse. And we're all in it. And it's time to graduate more students with honorable marks for having done it right. The time of playing hooky and being prudent and not doing the lesson and trying to escape the responsibilities. These times are passing because the world simply cannot support the abuses which have been heaped upon it. The time has come for the regeneration of these things, a universal reformation of human relationships with the interest be emphasis upon a unity in the world family and the recognition that we are all one group and that this group depends upon its own inner structure for survival. And if we work together, we can survive, we can protect resources, we can do all kinds of good things. But if we keep on paying other people to do it for us, we're going to be in the same condition we're in now indefinitely. It's time for us to do our own thing and do it right. Okay, sir. I'd like to also announce that uh, tomorrow evening my wife is having her uh, weekly, monthly meeting in uh, Monday evenings on uh, her subject of the uh, of the uh, laws of compassion and uh, love, truth, and the advancement of her little foundation, the Veritas Foundation. Well, she invites everyone who is interested in the study of the heart doctrine in daily life uh, would be interested, they'd be welcome as guests here tomorrow evening. And thank you very much for being with us.